welcome to The Lover's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. As always, you're with Mike. And with Ian. And we are rereading the Aubrey Matra novels of, you guessed it, Patrick O'Brien. Right. Ian, can you catch us up with where we were last week and where we're headed this week? With pleasure, Mike, with pleasure. Um, last time, Stephen Bondon and Joe Place had all set foot aboard the Polycrest, Jack Aubrey's new command. Stephen had been wondering whether his friendship with Jack could survive the rivalry between them over Diana Villiers. Meanwhile, debt collectors had crashed Pullings's promotion dinner, the Polycrest's construction and sailing, and also the ship's harsh discipline had all showed themselves to be problematic. Jack was crossed by a drunk youngster by the name of Parslow and by an angry surgeon and had threatened to have Stephen arrested if Stephen should resign. And I don't think we were terribly sure exactly how far to take that seriously, but it seemed like a serious enough conversation. Stephen had bargained finally for some short time and had said in a throwaway remark at the end of the chapter that in heading ashore, he was also going to go to Mapes. Now, Mike, this time we're going to learn more about the feelings between Jack and Stephen and Sophie and Diana in all the various directions. Tension is going to be mounting here between Stephen and Jack. There is, even so, an intelligence mission, a notion of the sublime, a grand dinner with three rivals and a song all about it, more trouble with Admiral Hart and Jack ashore, and we all know what that means. Right. Ha. Huh. So, Mike, Jack Ashore, we, we start out not with Jack Ashore, but with Stephen and Miss Williams. Which one of them is it? Right. We we do. We do. It's it's And it's funny. You know, we said that that was a throwaway remark by Stephen at the end of the chapter. But O'Brien also told us it was very deliberate. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, yeah, wow. And we open up right there. You're right. It's it's Stephen Ashore and a gentleman caller to see Miss Williams. And and I think even inside the Williams household, there's a little confusion here. Yeah. Cecilia hears that it's Dr. Matron, and she protests, even though the, the maid has told Sophie, she says, no, 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 he must be here to see me since Sophie already has two suitors. And Sophie kind of pushes her to one side. She heads down and both of them, Stephen and Sophie looking at each other, say simultaneously, you know, how happy I am to see you. Uh -huh. And O'Brien notes that both of them are, the text says, looking so pleased that a casual observer would have sworn they were lovers, mm -hmm. or at least that there was a particular attachment between them. So you know, this really deep bond between Sophie and Stephen. But Sophie is all about Jack Aubrey. She asks how the captain is doing. She's concerned that he's working too hard. Uh, she's so grateful that he has Dr. Matron, who she refers to as the only person he will listen to. Huh. You know, we think, boy, were it only so. She's sure that the captain's men must love him, hopes that what she's heard about the Polycrest oddity is not true, and that the captain and the ship will all be okay. And Stephen tries to reassure her mm. uh, a little bit on these concerns that uh, the Polycrest has come through a really tough storm recently, and it all went very well. So, you know, she may be odd, but she's seaworthy. And she hopes that that Jack is is eating well, taking care of himself. And Stephen tells her, well, he's he's poor, and so he can only eat the ship's food. But it's certainly helping with his weight loss. And I can't remember if he said it in this <laughs> chapter as he has in others, you know. He's no longer digging his grave with his teeth at the right. moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think in the canon, he's made a remark of some kind about Jack Aubrey's size about every other chapter. So it could be at least that, at least that. Well, Stephen turns the conversation round to her now, and he notices that her, her skin, her complexion is still lovely, but he notices to himself that he can see tiredness and sorrow beneath, and he's worried in turn about her weight. And like a good physician who knows a source of iron when he sees it, he prescribes um, stout or porter every day with dinner. And Mike, that's a, that's a prescription that we can relate to. That'll, that'll put lead in your pencil, as they say, and keep you astonishingly regular too. There you go. Now, somebody arrives here and is announced as Mr. Bowles. And Sophie asks the maid to tell Mr. Bowles that she's not at home and begs Cecilia to see him in the drawing room. And off Stephen and Sophie go to take a walk outside. 
And while they're walking in the park there, she tells Stephen just how unhappy she is. Unhappy about this respectful young man that they wanted to marry. The one her mother makes her see, he's such a bore. Interesting that she uses this word uh, just as Jack used it to mean, oh, he's tiresome. He has moist hands, heaven forbid. (laughs) He has moist hands. He sits and gasps for hours. I feel, she says, I feel that if he gasps at me just once more, I shall run my scissors into him. Ah, but I love this characterization here for Sophie. Like, independent woman. Yeah, he's not going to come near me anymore with this gasping. She, in turn, also doesn't like having to teach Sunday school to hand out tracts and to presume to go visiting in poor people's colleges and tell them how to be economical, knowing that she's never run a family or had to deal with a small income and looking after a family in the cottage. Mr. Bowles, this suitor, is a parson. His father is a bishop. And by the way, I think that's why she's being encouraged to go and do these good works so she can start to step into the role of vicar's wife around the parish. But she's not having any of this. She won't marry him, not even if it means she'll have to lead apes in hell, which is kind of an odd phrase. She says, though, there's only one man she'll marry if he'll have her. She had him and threw him away. And at this point, she breaks down. The tears flow. And Mike, this is sad for us, but at least we know now where Sophie stands on her relationship with Jack. At least one of the people in this story is direct and straightforward about how she feels about somebody else. But Mike, leading apes into hell, I've got a feeling we've heard that somewhere else before. What? Where, where does that take us? We did. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you know, we encountered this phrase in the Commodore. So right. slight spoiler, you heal the phrase again if you're Hello to just- Lionel Richie. <laughs> Yeah, right. That's right. Uh, and, and, you know, after a lot of research in that one, we thought, well, there's some different takes on what it means. We found that Shakespeare uses it twice and, and in different ways. The primary school of thought seems to be like an old maid's punishment after death for neglecting to increase and multiply was said to be leading apes in hell. Huh. So if you decided to become an old maid, you're, you know, you didn't increase and multiply as the Bible told you to. And, and this seems to be a little bit Shakespeare's act to scene one in the Taming of the Shrew, where Katerina, the older sister, says, and for your love to her, lead apes in hell. In other words, you know, this is what you're doing to me. You know, I'm, I'm going to be leading apes in hell. I'm going to die a maid because of her father's love for her younger sister. You right. Know, that's in much ado about nothing. But Beatrice, another character in Shakespeare, takes issue with this kind of interpretation, saying that although she'll be sent to hell for being a maid, the devil will then send her right back to heaven, and St. Peter will seat her with all the bachelors, and they will live as merry as the day is long. So <laughs> That's like, a very 21st yeah, century yeah. outlook. Yeah, Amen, exactly. Sister. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not buying that here. There's got to be some, in fact, there's got to be an infinite number of single men in heaven, right? So, Right. That's right. That's exactly right. They didn't, they didn't multiply there. Well, H.W. Jansen wrote a book, Apes and Ape Lore in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. He disagrees with the reasoning for this punishment. He argues that the ape was a symbol of fornication. Huh. And by refusing to marry, he argues, men were forced to seek sex outside of marriage, making them fornicators, apes. So the belief was that old maids, by refusing to marry, were leading otherwise good men into hell. That, you know, they were wow. not married, so they're led into sin. And I'd say that's some first class, world class mansplaining and justification that's right up there with Adam's famous, you know, don't look at me, God, the, the woman gave me the apple. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. But that's where it came from. And Stephen and Sophie keep walking. Stephen asks if there's some way she can let Jack know, you know, how she feels, that he's just heard her confess it to him because he's telling her, you know, Jack can't make a move. She's an heiress. He's poor. He has no prospects. He's got a load of debt. And he goes on saying, you know, I know your mother would not approve a proposal from Jack. And Sophie says, well, you know, I did write to him. And Stephen says, oh, I remember that letter, but it came too late. And she says, oh, I wish it hadn't, because if Jack had come once more to Bath, she would have told him and they would have come to an understanding. It's even saying, you know, an engagement. And she says, no, you know, I couldn't have done that, but I would have told him 
that I will wait for him as long as it takes. I will not bind him, she said, because I know it's different for men. And if he didn't marry someone else, she would be there even if she had to wait past the time that she could have children, despite the fact that she would love to have children. So, wow. boy, this is a pretty, pretty strong yeah. commitment on Sophie's part. Amazing. That's real deep love that she has for, the, for her man here. Yeah. Now, Stephen has some hope. He thinks that Sophie can still make Aubrey understand her mind and her position here. She, he knows, doesn't want to pursue or distress or embarrass Jack with, with this kind of social nicety that seems to be getting in everybody's way in this story. As you pointed out, Mike, she knows that these things are in society different for men. Stephen reminds her of the wretched story of her engagement about the en alleged engagement to this other fella. She says she would not have been such an odious, jealous ninny as to go along with that particular ruse of her mother's. Even though she won't marry without her mother's consent, she won't marry anyone else, despite what her mother wants. So she's got a very, very fine and deeply held point of view about where, where the nuance lies between um, obedience and disobedience to her mother. She doesn't want to run away. She doesn't want to be cut off. She doesn't want to be a burden to her husband as opposed to being a help. And they happen to see Admiral Haddock, who has gone off to do something to do with the, the fencibles or the impress serving and is going to be sailing to Plymouth with an old friend in the Genereux, which is a ship that Jack had brought into Mahon li literally moments before Master and Commander opened. That was what Jack was doing as Lieutenant Jack. And Admiral Haddock then has invited Sissy and Sophia to join him at his official residence in Plymouth for the summer. So there's a chance there for Sophie to get some, some proximity, if not some actual Jack FaceTime. Now, as they're walking along, Sophie now points to a particular spot, a particular piece of terrain, and says, this is the place where Diana and I quarreled. And Mike, I would love to have been around for this quarrel. There are a couple of things in this chapter where I think, oh, I, I wish we'd been there. And you can kind of see why O'Brien made some choices about not placing us there. I'd like to have seen Diana and Sophie going at it. Sophie says she had had a bad day with this suitor, Mr. Bowles. She had gone riding. She'd seen Diana there. Diana had taunted her with the idea that she, Diana, could see Jack anytime. They had got to calling each other names, shouting at each other, as Sophie says, like a couple of fishwives. She said she could marry him anytime she wanted, but she had, she, this is Diana speaking, yeah. she had no notion of a half-pay captain or any other woman's leavings. So at that, Sophie had threatened to hit Diana with a riding crop, and Mrs. Williams had come along very, very frightened, trying to make them kiss and be friends. She wouldn't, and Diana then had been banished or had taken herself away to stay with the cousin in Dover. And Mike, it, I think it was pretty clear from the way the writing flowed here that this thing with the riding crop was real. Like Diana really thought that Sophie was about to do her some damage. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this from Diana's perspective as well. You're, yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Well, Stephen says that now that Sophie has confided so much in him, he has to be equally candid with her and tells her that he is very much attached to Diana. Uh, and she says, oh, you know, gosh, Stephen, I, I hope I haven't hurt you, you know, speaking ill of Diana here. Um, she thought that it was Jack that was attached to Diana. And... Stephen asks her if Diana is, in her mind, wholly in love with Jack. And she says that she doesn't believe that Diana knows what love is. Uh, that, that's a pretty penetrating insight by our Sophie there. Right. Well, we, we get, you know, kind of a very rapid change of scene here. All of a sudden, Stephen is now making another call, and he's at Diana's cousin's door so he's gone away where Diana has been banished. And he, you know, he's announced, he's sitting downstairs reading through lots of things, waiting, waiting, waiting. Diana's upstairs. She, you know, she, she hears that it's matron. She changes her dress. She combs her hair. She looks, O'Brien says, searchingly at her face in the mirror. And when she finally comes into the parlor, Stephen says, Good day to you now, Villers. No man on earth could call you a fast woman. Huh. And I thought. Uh oh, <laughs> yeah, a little, yeah. little O'Brien double entendre there. Yeah, yeah. I know you've been dillying around with, with Jack. You are a fast woman. But 
Stephen hands her a gift. It's a bottle of scent. And Diane is just delighted. She says, you know, this is real perfume. And and she names it Marciac. It's a a region of France known for its lavender. And she asks, Mm. how in the world Stephen got it? And Stephen says, from a smuggler he do in deal. She says it smells like mogul's harem. And, and this is a harem where the wives and the female relatives and the concubines of the mogul rulers of the whole Indian subcontinent lived back in, you know, from like the 15 to the 1800s. Yeah. She apologizes for having been so disagreeable to him in London and asks how in the world he found her. He said he'd just come from Mapes. And she said, oh, you know, I guess you heard about my battle with Sophie. So here we go. Here's here's the rest of the story. Right. The story as told from Diana's perspective. And she says that she'd been a little bit, well, more than a little, she'd been angered by Sophie and what Diana calls her mooning and tragic airs. If Sophie had wanted Jack, she thinks she should have taken him when she had him. She now has a perfectly suitable admirer. And I think Diana is pretty, pretty mean here, but you know, she's, saying this guy, Bowles, is a clergyman. He has plenty of money. He'll probably become a bishop. And in response to this remark, Sophie had really come out fighting. And Diana says she was surprised by Diana's fighting spirit. It did turn into a long fight. Diana says she was hoarse for a week. And that she, like you said, Mike, it was genuinely frightened when Sophie had offered to slash her across the face with the riding crop. Diana reports that she had been glad when Mrs. Williams had come up and stopped the fight and sent Diana away. Mrs. Williams, she says, shouldn't have been too worried about the parson, meaning she she believed that Mrs. Williams was wanting to keep Diana clear of perhaps turning the head of this parson who was being maneuvered in for a a marriage suit with Sophie. She dismisses the parson for her own sake as, as a greasy oaf and now tells Stephen that it is his duty, Stephen's duty, to be gay and amusing for her since she hasn't said anything unkind since he arrived. And by my count, he's probably been there a whole 10 minutes. So that's not a very high bar. (laughs) I haven't been mean to you yet, so say something nice. She says she is happy to have come away from this particular fight uh, with her face with what she calls her fortune, her looks intact. You haven't paid me a compliment yet, she says to Stephen. Reassure me about my face because I'll be 30 soon and I can't trust the mirror. And my, I know, I know, you and I are looking anxiously ahead to the time when our 30th birthday comes on. You know, what we see in the mirror doesn't suit us anymore. Right, right. <laughs> well, Stephen looks at it and says, well, it, it's, it's a good face. Uh, <laughs> you know, kind of damn with faint praise, perhaps. Yeah. But we get kind of his reflection in his mind that now here he is looking at it in the cold light of the winter sun. And he sees her as a middle-aged woman for the first time. He thinks, you know, India's sun and and climate had not been kind to her complexion, which as he thinks about it now is really nothing compared to Sophia's. And he says in a few years, other people would see that Sophie had slashed it deep. Yeah. And I thought, oh, wow, wow. So, and I was to my own mind going, so did she hit her with the riding crop? Or is it that it's this constant Diana comparing herself to Sophie, which is probably more what's going on here? Yeah, I think so. I think she's talking about the kind of me- metaphorical slashes rather than physical slashes. Yeah. But yeah, for, for Diana, they're almost as bad, right? Her, her self esteem is all right. tied up here. And Sophie, However bravely Diana can talk about it, I think Sophie's taken a bit of a whack at Diana's self-esteem and doesn't realize maybe the power that she has there. Well, I think Stephen's trying to recover himself, having said it was a good face. Yeah. And he says, an astonishing face, a damned good figurehead, as we say in the Navy. And Jeez. it has launched one ship at least, meaning you're like Helen of Troy to me. Yeah. You know, you launched the ship. To, and Diana says, a damned good figurehead, she said bitterly. And Stephen thinks to himself, now for the harrow. And I thought, (laughs) wow. And Diana responds with the harrow. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and by the way, I don't think what she's about to say is fair, but he's earned a little bit of this. I think a damned good figurehead is not, you know, you wouldn't ever whip it out on a first date, would you? 
you? You wouldn't write it on the inside of Valentine's card. No, no, Stephen, that's a bad choice. Anyhow, here goes with Diana's response. Why do you pursue me like this? I give you no encouragement. I never have. I told you plainly at Bruton Street that I liked you as a friend, but had no use for you as a lover. Why do you persecute me? What do you want of me? If you think to gain your point by wearing me out, you have reckoned short. And even if you were to succeed, you would only regret it. There she speaks the truth (laughs) for now. You do not know who I am at all. Everything proves it. And Stephen can't stick around here. Uh, I must go, he says, getting up. And she's pacing nervously up and down the room. Go then, she cried, and tell your lord and master I never want to see him again either. He is a coward. And wow, like she is lashing out the the, 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 the metaphorical, metaphysical wounds, um, the insult to her self-esteem have wounded her. And she's she's a wounded animal, I think, here. Really, really cruel words to Stephen and cruel words to Jack. And this thing about calling Jack Stephen's lord and master, like, I don't know where the heck that came from. But uh, Stephen saw this coming. And Stephen is about to try and withdraw himself from the situation. But he called it the harrow, Mike. T- tell us a bit about that term and where might O'Brien have plucked it from? Well, it's, it's interesting because I, I use harrows in the pastures. Right. And, you know, there's these heavy metal frames with these like metal teeth that you drag over the land to kind of break up the clods of dirt here. And the harrow also means to cause distress. So I think she's absolutely on it. And I was fascinated, you know, as you were saying, she's kind of suffering a little bit. She's had this, this kind of uh, affront. But you know, this seems to be, we're now seeing it for the second time in a row, anytime Stephen goes to leave, she comes apart a little bit. Yeah. You know, when, when he was about to take Jack away and here as well. And, and this, this complete mood change kind of flashed me back to the same way she had turned on Jack at Queenie's party yeah. you know when she called jack a coward which he does again now here it's almost as if she's more desperate to have him the more he looks like he's going to walk away and yeah. doesn't react with lots of emotion i don't know yeah so i mean for for all we're team steven i think it's, it's fair to say he doesn't have the emotional vocabulary to deal successfully with a woman like diana in this kind of situation and maybe he's smarter than all of us right maybe right he now, is right so we're <laughs> Proof suit might be the best thing. Yeah, yeah, know. it might be. It might be. But luckily, it gets broken up a little bit. Right. I mean, in, in amongst this anguish and, and real pain for characters that we care about, we get a brilliant comic turn. It seems very out of place at first, but you realize how beautifully well O'Brien is kind of slipping this in here. The crazy cousin, Mr. Lowndes, who is in the resident in this place where Diana is staying, he comes in. And he's glad to learn that Maturin is, after all, a naval surgeon and not a mad doctor, not one of those people who keep coming in to subject him to cold baths. He is happy that Maturin is making his living upon the sea and not in it. The sea, and he goes on about the sea, is important. We're all going to be dried up by the dread simoom, by the hot dry wind. He offers Maturin tea to keep him from desiccation and uh, offers to have Maturin take the teapot, which was apparently a gift from Queen Anne to his grandmother. And after he does a little dance and plays the fool a little bit, he sits down and says, I'm going to share you my poem. And the poem that he reads uh, starts out as being the opening line of Virgil's Aeneid, of arms and the man I sing. And he carries on with et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I might, besides being funny, I think there's a bit of O'Brien signaling going on here. Like Virgil's Aeneid, along with a couple of other of the great classical works of sort of you know, men at war type uh, mythology. This is the mother load for the kind of classical references that O'Brien adheres to. And O'Brien would just about like to be compared, I think, with Homer and Virgil. It's funny and and maybe also shows a bit of backhanded or reverse psychology. O'Brien reveres classics like Virgil, the Aeneid in particular. So his backhanded way of saying, I'm not worthy to talk about this work is to put a quotation from it in the mouth of a comic lunatic who we don't take seriously, but is, by the way, an excellent flute player. Maybe, or maybe it's not so backhanded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a- a- anyhow, serious thoughts and connections with classical literature don't stick around very long um, because Mr. Lowndes is not going to stop there at quoting Virgil. 
He asks Stephen then if he's a Grecian uh, and offers to share um, some Priapean odes. Priapus is a minor Greek fertility god, protector of livestock and plants and gardens, and male genitalia. And many of the Priapian odes, like uh, Pullings' earlier cannon polishes that we heard about earlier on, are phallic. There's a lot of phallic imagery being invoked here, uh, and hence the, the reply that Stephen gives. And Mike, if I was to be very cheesy and use a stand-up comics joke, this is like Lowndes coming along and nudging Stephen in the ribs going, do you have a little Greek in you? Would you like some? <laughs> well, St- Stephen's having none of this. He says, unless you're going to share the odes in Greek, then perhaps we should not do so while ladies are present. And he then turns to cousin Edwards and asks him, being a young man, have, have you noticed this young woman? He says, I was young once. And goes on to ask whether Stephen, as a doctor, thinks incest is really so undesirable. <laughs> okay, well, all the different, all the different dimensions of human sexuality in two paragraphs here. Um, Diana says, "Let's let's stop this in its tracks. Why don't you go and have a bath, cousin Edward?" Well, we're again transported out of the scene. We're all of a sudden back on the ship. Thank heavens, Jack asks Stephen for the news from Mapes. Um, and he reports, Stephen reports, that Diana and Sophie have parted brass rags, mm-hmm. another another phrase we explored in the Commodore. And Ian, you, you had said then that you know, this is kind of uh, uh, perhaps more used over your part of the world than, than I remembered. Yeah. yeah, just meaning two people falling out of a friendship of some kind and dividing up their possessions, right? Right. Exactly. Sort of like that, you know, the guys on the ship that would share a bag of, of, of rags to polish brass on. Well, you know, they've done that. And he also reports that Diana has invited the two of them to dinner in Dover on Friday. Mm. And Stephen said, you know, I, I accepted for myself, but I certainly couldn't speak for you, Jack. I, I, you know, I said that, you know, you might not find it possible to go ashore. And Jack is kind of, you know, kind of leaves off all thought about Sophie and says, you know, are you sure Diana invited me? Mm-hmm. And um, I was like, whoa, you're not going to ask more about Sophie? You want to zero in on Diana? And now, oh my gosh, end to Stephen here. But luckily, we're a little bit interrupted by Babington telling the captain that the flagship has signaled for all captains. <laughs> Thank you, Babington. <laughs> right. Oh, boy. There's so many conversations that we can't wait to get out of here. It's hilarious. <laughs> well, Stephen then sets to to help Jack get ready to go see the Admiral. And as Jack is dressing, Stephen sees all of Jack's wounds. And maybe there's a connection here between Diana's kind of emotional and metaphysical wounds and Jack's real wounds. All the scars on his back from the pike thrust that Stephen says might have killed him if it had gone just a half an inch to the left. All the other kind of musket ball wounds and slashes and scars. And all of this remarking by Stephen on the the physical side of, of Jack's scars here upsets him rather and he turns the conversation around to ask how Sophie's doing. Well, says Stephen, she's low in spirits. She's subjected to the attentions of a moneyed parson. And I think he might have expected that that would get a response from Jack. But Jack, for now, says nothing. Doesn't turn around. Stephen goes on and says, well, Killick had asked if he could rejoin the ship. He says that the lawyer's men have been reported as hanging around Melbury. And Stephen had told Killick to come and ask the captain. So, huh, okay. I'd almost forgotten that Killick wasn't around, actually, and that he was still over at Mapes. And Jack goes on and says, well, Stephen, you should have an assistant, a surgeon's mate, because you work too hard. And all the way through these chapters, as the friendship is coming under more and more pressure, it's really kind of heartbreaking that from time to time, each of them will just be a little solicitous of the other and a little loving towards the other, but in a very kind of, um, not half-hearted, but only half-successful way. He says, you work too hard. You need a surgeon's mate. By the way, spoilers surgeon's mate is a thing that's coming and you know that if you look at the uh, the series of book titles that are coming up for us in the canon here ah. so in this w- one last little bit of friendship and tenderness Stephen notices grey hairs appearing in Jack's ponytail and apropos of perhaps not much Jack points out that Canning had stopped by remember I think Jack had thought that he'd seen the last of Canning but Canning had stopped by and Jack for his part had invited Canning to dine 
aboard the Polycrest the following night. Now, this doesn't sound like it has all the possibilities of great success, Mike, because you know, to, to invite a wealthy man like Canning aboard, Jack needs some supplies, and he's going to be short in that regard. He is, and I'm sure Stephen is not looking forward. You know, Stephen realizes that this is another rival for Diana's affection. Yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting here. Well, Jack, as you say, Ian remembers now that he's mentioned inviting Canning to eat that he has no money. You know, just you know, Stephen had given him an earlier loan. He had gotten three months lunar pay upon joining the Polycrest but he used it all on the customary presence yeah. and he had not been able to buy any stores for the captain's cabin. Consequently, he'd also been unable to invite any of the officers to dine with him. And he'd had to turn down the last gun room in invitation because he knew he couldn't reciprocate. So he's thinking, gosh, you know, I don't want to look like a scrub, not keeping up the captain's dignity in his cabin. And his presence, Stuart, like you say, Ian, I had forgotten too that, yeah, Killick wasn't there. So right. earlier when there had been this fight between these two stewards, it wasn't Killick no. that Jack was so upset with, which makes a lot more sense here. But this, you know, this present steward keeps saying, you know, well, what, when, when are all your supplies coming aboard? How am I going to keep pressuring Jack? Like, hey, you know, I'm your steward and I got nothing to do here. Well, Jack also knows he's soon going to have to entertain the Admiral and the other captains in the fleet. But right now I got Canning coming tomorrow and nothing to serve him. And usually he thinks to himself, he'd ask Stephen right away. And Stephen's always too happy to help. But O'Brien writes something in the atmosphere, some chill or reserve or inward scruple of his own prevented him from completing his sentence. And then doesn't complete the sentence, and he's got to leave. He's got to go respond to this all-captain's flag here. So clearly things are still problematic between Jack and Stephen. Yeah. And with Stephen having visited both Sophie and Diana, you would have thought, as I said earlier, yeah. that Jack would have reacted more to Sophie than to Diana, but he didn't. So this even bodes worse yeah. for both of them, I think. It's a, a super uncomfortable, you know, creeping extra, extra bits of discomfort in the friendship here with every paragraph. Right. Anyhow, Jack goes over to the flagship, and as he comes back, all of the members of the Polycrest ship's company believe that they can tell that she's been ordered out. Now, Parker had drilled the crew over and over to make sure that they could unmoor in good order. Seeing all of this coming aboard, Jack says, actually, no. It's not going to be today. So he calls out to Babington, who's been showing some of the landsmen, the new guys aboard, how to grease the masts. Says, get cleaned up, put on your best uniform, take the blue cutter with Bondon and six reliable bargemen who, who, who deserve liberty, and take them all to Dover. And he's writing this note for Babington to carry to Diana, very formally saying he regrets that duty prevents him from accepting her kind invitation for that Friday. He hopes he has the pleasure of waiting on her when he returns. He says to Stephen that Babington is taking my excuses. Do you want to send a note to Diana? And Stephen says he's very glad that Jack's not going ashore. It would be extreme folly. N not the last time. Stephen's going to try and point out to Jack the difficulty that he places himself in. It would be extreme folly with everyone knowing that the Polycrest is on this station. So Babington takes Jack's note. He takes Stephen's verbal expression of compliments and regrets and heads off for Diana's. So as, as we see Babington departing with this note and reminded again of this really awkward situation between Stephen and Jack, again in this chapter, we get light relief, but this time from a familiar character. Parker reports that somebody who wishes to come aboard, presenting himself as a man by the name of Killick, and Parker doesn't know who Killick is, but we do. Jack says, I'm very happy to see you. What have you brought? And Killick is very, very pleased with himself, I think, that he's got all these hampers from Mapes. He's got pork. He's got cheeses. He's got butter and cream. He's got poultry and game from the estate of Admiral Haddock, who's clearing his land. He's bought a prime roebuck and several hares that he'd caught. Another deer that had gotten caught in the wheels of the cart, like roadkill. Excellent, Killick. Well done. And this is all sounding great. There's a slightly tricky moment when... Jack notices that the hamper from Mapes is addressed to Dr. Maturin. Eek. But 
Kelly kind of brushes past that. Oh, he says it's all one. Miss Williams told him what to do with everything. She'd prepared the souse for the soused hog's face, just the way the captain liked it. She had included white puddings for the doctor's breakfast. White puddings being like a blood sausage, but without the blood. White puddings for the doctor's breakfast. And Jack thinks to himself, how much a man's heart can break <laughs> over a soused hog's face? Which, which is an association only a sailor like Jack Aubrey could pick up on here. He pretends to turn and look at all the Admiral's game while he, meanwhile, asks Killick if he brought the rest of the wine. And I think he knows that this is going to come up with a... He's going to stumble across a bit of petty uh, larceny on the part of Killick here. Well, says Killick, all of the bottles broke, sir, except for six burgundies. And Jack cocks his eye at Killick, sighs, and says nothing. So, Mike, at least we've got something to drink and a fair amount to eat by the sound of it for this feast. We do. We do. Jack's, you know, saved now. You, you, you know, couldn't ask Stephen, but he's saved. He invites Mr. Parker and Mr. McDonald, you know, two men who had entertained him well out of their own private stores. These two guys, the lieutenant and the head of the Marines, both have, you know, a lot of independent means. Yeah. And they've entertained Jack. Now he's you know, reciprocating, come to the cabin and dine tomorrow. And Jack asks Stephen, but Stephen doesn't answer <laughs> at first. And Jack's wondering about that. And Stephen finally accepts and says his mind was dwelling on an inquisitive and slightly vulgar concern upon the state of Mother Williams. And what about her heart when she finds out her dairy poultry guard, her pig house, her larder have all been stripped bare. Will her heart stop? Will it dry out completely? Not a great step he adds. (laughs) It's pretty dry already. And then he's thinking and telling Jack, you know, how is Sophie going to reply? She lies with about as much skill as preserved killing. (laughs) Yeah, the wine bottles, they all broke, sir. Right. Except for the ones I don't like. Right. Well, Jack has an immense mental pain. He's, he's thinking about that. And, and finally, he jerks his mind away and cries within about how he loves Sophie so. And then he walks off. And later, he comes back and he asks Stephen if Canning, who's a Jew, can eat roebuck or hair. And Stephen says, well, you know, you can always look it up in a Bible if you have one. And Jack says, you know, I, I do. I've been reading it after I looked up Hennage's signal from the last chapter here. <laughs> And he says, I'm thinking about using it to preach a sermon to the ship's company on Sunday. And Stephen can't help himself as Jack talks. You know, Stephen doubles over in his chair, rocking with these spasmodic squeaks and tears running down his face. And Jack, who's actually never seen Stephen laugh, is completely put out. Uh, O'Brien writes, he turned away with something about pragmatical apes simpering, tittering, and affected to look into the Bible without the least concern. But there are not many who can find themselves the object of open, wholehearted, sincere, prostrating laughter without being put out of countenance. And Jack was not one of these. <laughs> I thought, wow, what a great sentence. I love the sentence. I, I love the scene as well of like, first of all, Jack's complete innocence and unselfconscious. Of course I could preach a sermon. And Stephen is like just killing himself laughing at this and of course it's not a completely breaking a ice type situation because Stephen is laughing at jack not with jack and there's a bit of a roast implied in this whole laughter that Stephen has anyway it's funny Stephen's laughter finally subsides he takes jack's hand he apologizes and says i had such a ludicrous comic droll association of ideas don't take it personally of course he says you should preach to the men It will have a most striking effect. And I can just imagine him sort of breaking back into a giggle at the end of that. (laughs) Now, it's interesting to figure here whether Stephen was comparing Jack to the moist-handed, sighing parson and just how much that might have been in Stephen's mind as he was thinking about Ah, Jack here. Stephen says, what text are you going to preach? And Jack comes back with the same question that I think we've got as well, which is, are you still making game? Are you still on at me? Am I still being hazed here? He says, I'm going to use the one about saying, I say, come, and he cometh, for I am a centurion. He wants to show that it's God's will that there should be discipline on the ship. Tis in the book, he says. 
and any infernal bastard that disobeys is therefore a blasphemer too, and certainly will be damned. And Stephen says, well, do you think it'll be easier for the crew to bear their station when they learn that it is all providential? And he's setting that up for a potential no, or at least for a potential debate. And Jack is tapping the Bible. He's quite confident. Yes, he says, that's it. It's all here. And, and Mike, I, I love this scene. I also have a really horrid feeling about this phrase, any infernal bastard. For those of us who have a clue what's coming in this book, um, this phrase, I think, is a really grim bit of foreshadowing in what is otherwise a fairly lighthearted, potentially innocent conversation between Jack and Stephen here. But let's not go there yet. Um, tell us a bit about the centurion. Does this? Do you think Jack's onto something that authority of, of fighting men is preordained by God? Boy, this is this is this is what always scares me about you know, <laughs> people. You know, uh, as they say, the devil can quote scripture for his own advantage. There, yeah, people that pull this stuff out. The the healing of the centurion servant. It's, it's in both Matthew and Luke. Matthew chapter eight and Luke seven. And there's slightly different accounts in the two Gospels about this miracle where this Gentile, meaning a non-Jewish military officer, wants Jesus to heal his servant. But in, depending on the story, you know, he, he either sends people to Jesus or he goes himself saying that, you know, Jesus, you, you don't have to come to my house to heal the servant. Jesus' authority is so great that all he has to do is to give a command to make it so. So that's I, I say, come and he cometh for I am a centurion. He's kind of saying, look, I, I can do this, but you can do anything because you're this guy. And Jesus kind of looks around to everybody as he's hearing this and says, you know, I've, I've never seen greater faith than this man's in, in all of everybody in Israel. It's like, look, you guys read about the Messiah and you're not getting it. And this guy who's never heard anything about this, he gets it here. So it's a story of faith, mm. not a story to endorse that authority is is commanded by the Bible here. A centurion is a Roman military officer who has command of a hundred men, right. a century of men, hence a centurion. And and I, I hope that over the centuries, we've learned that this whole appointed, anointed by God thing can be a real slippery slope as people use it for their own ends. Uh, of course, it would never happen today. Oh, goodness well, me, no. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. But I, I was glad to say that with Jack's fumbling around the Bible, at least he did go back and uh, probably hit Leviticus and found out that no, Roebuck is not unclean. I can serve this to Cammy. Okay, so he did do good. some practical good. Thank you, Jack. Some of his biblical well, scholarship is reliable. Right. Well, if, if, if the Roebuck can be prepared for dinner, and if we can all be prepared for a sermon from Jack Aubrey, I think both of those things might require a bit of refreshment. So why don't we just uh, take a pause here and we'll get right back after this short break. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hold. So welcome back. Um, we hope that you managed to grab a glass from one of your six remaining bottles of Burgundy and maybe tried your hand at a venison pasty, who knows, with the Roebuck. Anyhow, Jack is looking ahead to this dinner party. He knows that it's going to be a success when he sees Canning coming aboard in a plain buff coat. He's not putting any seafaring airs on, but even so, he comes up the side like a veteran. And this really endears him to Jack and all the other seagoing officers here. There were pleasantries. There was lots of asking after people, including Miss Villiers. And when asked if he's heard any good music, Canning highly recommends Figaro. He means the marriage of Figaro at the opera. He says he's seen it three times. And Mike, this is like O'Brien's signature opera work. This is a, an opera on the theme of marital fidelity and smart women and philandering men. We should stick a hundred pins in it. But it's really right. interesting that it comes up at this point here. Jack appreciates that Canning says very little, actually, about the Polycrest, other than that, that she must be an interesting ship with prodigious capabilities, and he admires her paintwork, all of which is to say he doesn't say anything about, this is a very weird, cross-grained-looking vessel that you've got here. And Parker and Pullings and all the seamen are very, very happy that he navigates this 
finding some point of praise for the polycrest with a bit of diplomacy. Now, as they move through the meal and the wine, there's more laughter coming from the cabin. And we're seeing and hearing this a little bit from the perspective of Killick and the, the, the guards and the men who are on duty looking out for the, uh, for the diners here. After the venison, which Canning says is the best he's ever had, Canning continues to praise the meal, praise the wine. And meanwhile, Pullings and Parker get to explain to him Bonaparte's intentions, intentions for the invasion fleet, perhaps. They talk about these new French gunboats, ship-rigged prams, prams being like flat-bottom boats. Um, Stephen and MacDonald, meanwhile, are in an argument that threatens to grow warm. And uh, my, I know that O'Brien can't resist poking fun at people with Scottish accents and the Scottish culture, but here at least I think Stephen's met his match. MacDonald is not going to be kind of poo-pooed here for his Scottishness. When they both have full mouths, Jack, having heard something that they were talking about, he says, Ossian, come back to Ossian in a minute, Ossian, was he not that gentleman that was quite exploded by Dr. Johnson? And MacDonald, who clearly swallows a mouthful of Roebuck and gets right back in here, says, no, 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 Dr. Johnson had a very narrow prejudice against Scotland, adding, he had no notion of the sublime and therefore no appreciation of Ossian. Meaning that Dr. Johnson, the great writer and lexicographer, hadn't appreciated grandeur or beauty. Now, sublimity, the the sublime, we might well come back to in a second. And meanwhile, Stephen is up for a rationalistic challenge to MacDonald. He says, produce your manuscripts, meaning show us the written word, the evidence. And, And MacDonald asks then whether Stephen really expects a Highland gentleman to produce his manuscripts upon compulsion. And it seems like it might be a bit of a point of honour. And just before we get further into this debating contest between Stephen and MacDonald and and literature, tell us a bit, Mike, about Ossian. Is this purely a Scottish story? No, no, it's really interesting. Uh, This this Ossian is a famous character in Gaelic literature. He's the father of the supposed third century Finn McCool. Uh We encounter elsewhere in the canon, you know, we... There's great tales around that. But in 1760, a Scottish poet, James McPherson, published Fingal. It's you know, supposedly a collection of epic poems and verses ascribed to Ossian. Um, and McPherson said that he had translated them from newly found Ossian manuscripts. And I think that's Stephen's produce your manuscripts. All right. We've seen McPherson's work. Show us what he was working from. Well, in, in 1775, Dr. Johnson, who we discussed several times throughout the canon, had disputed Ossian's existence, you know, whether he was even a real figure or just something you know, kind of apocryphal or mythical. And he disputed McPherson's honesty, a controversy that ran until 1807 when a committee of learned Scots actually debunked McPherson's supposed manuscripts. Huh. Point for Stephen. Now, <laughs> Right. It, it turns out that way. But in the meantime, this work, Fingal, was, it became internationally popular and extremely influential in the development of the Romantic movement, yeah. uh, the Gaelic revival, and Romantic nationalist works in Scotland and all across Europe later in the 1800s. Yeah. Now, the, today, scholars would say that you know the consensus probably is that McPherson composed these poems himself, drawing upon the Gaelic poetry that he connected from, you know, he did a lot of extensive research in the oral tradition. So going and listening to all these people and then writing this stuff down. And they were good enough that he's buried among the literary giants in Westminster Abbey. Huh. So, um, you know, we've got this. And as we've seen before, when we talked about Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson was not blameless in all this. You know, sometimes he kind of gets set up as an expert. He's made comments like calling Gaelic the rude speech of a barbarous people. Ooh. And so, you know, I don't I don't think this was completely objective here. Folks like on my side of the pond, Thomas Jefferson and Henry David Thoreau uh, and, and others elsewhere, including Napoleon himself, thought these works were as good or better than Homer. So huh. a lot of strong, strong opinion about these things. Yeah. Scottish romanticism or romantic Scottishism, people went nuts for it in the 19th century. You know, 
Felix Mendelssohn wrote Fingal's Cave, Walter Scott and Ivanhoe, all this kind of hey nonny no versions of kind of romantic Scottish literature kind of got really, really popular. And uh, we're clearly touching a nerve here on this topic of literature that is you know, for or about the romantic ideas of Scotland. Right. Anyhow, instead of producing his manuscripts, which, as you've said, Mike, would be debunkable, uh, MacDonald turns to... <laughs> He, he does a little ad hominem attack on Dr. Johnson, which is a perfectly sound debating tactic if you know that you're backed up in a corner. Points out factual inaccuracies in Dr. Johnson's work. Dr. Johnson had, had said that there were no trees in Scotland. Well, clearly there are. Uh, there are two nautical definitions that he'd missed completely in his dictionary. And Jack is shocked by the mistakes and says he has no doubt Ossian himself then was a very honest fellow, and therefore we're allowed to doubt a little bit about what uh, what Dr. Johnson had thought and written. MacDonald concludes his Dr. Johnson argument by saying, and fulsome in uno, fulsome in omnibus. Why, yes, said Jack, who was as well acquainted with old omnibus as any man there present. Fulsome in omnibus. What do you say to omnibus, Stephen? I concede the victory, said Stephen, smiling. Omnibus routes me. A glass of wine with you, Doctor, said MacDonald. So, b- besides being a very elegant and good-humoured way for them all to get out of this conversation, th- Mike, th- this is like a big strike at the heart of O'Brien. If he, I, I don't know if he even realises it. So this falsum in uno, falsum in omnibus thing is a, a Latin phrase for the common law principle that if you're false in one thing, like in your testimony as a witness, then you can be deemed to be false in everything. And uh, maybe O'Brien should have been acquainted with this just as well as Jack. This is a real strike, maybe even against O'Brien himself. So let's just dig into this, this, this Latin thing for a minute. Jack himself is no Latin scholar. And maybe O'Brien is telling us that he, O'Brien, knows the common law principle. Or maybe that Jack or perhaps Patrick O'Brien and the reader know that Jack is being false in several key things at the minute. So maybe this is initially a strike at Jack, but I read this and I think this is a strike at O'Brien himself. If he tells us, as, as we know they are now, untruths about his Irishness, about his early private life, about his knowledge of the, the sea and sailing, then is he to be trusted <laughs> with truths about these characters and about human relationships and about everything else that he tries to be authoritative about? It's It's really tricky given what we no, was revealed about Patrick O'Brien many, many, many uh, years, even decades later than the time at which he wrote this book. So he, he left a bit of a risk for himself here. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, Ian, about the amazing research that Dean King yeah. did about you know O'Brien and how all that kind of changed the landscape a lot. Yeah, really, yeah. really. Anyhow, Stephen has very graciously found a way down from his argument. He concedes the point. I'm, I'm sure he's no fan of Dr. Johnson. And maybe Stephen, like other Irish people who are familiar with the the, 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 the Irish myth-making, might have felt that Macpherson's work being Gaelic but being passed off as Scottish was somehow a misappropriation of Irish folklore, which is something you'd expect Stephen be, would be a bit prickly about. However, we have peace in the gun room, and it seems like we're not even done yet because the bottles of Burgundy are only half drunk so far. Right. Outside the dinner, some of the crew members are sharing a little bit of the wine that they've been kind of removing from the table here. And they're talking about how the officers are eating and drinking so much that they and their guests, Mr. Canning, are all going to have to be carried to their cots or taken off on a bosun's chair. And inside, Canning is admiring the figgy dowdy and the bosun's grog. You know, this is the first time he's ever had them. He's glad to have the experience of dining upon a Royal Navy man of war for the first time as well. And is anxious to, you know, acquire anything with a naval taste about it. And Canning returns to the topic of the wonderful Figaro he saw at the opera. The woman singing Susanna, he says, is a revelation, a grace and a purity that he's never heard in his life. In other words, we're back to the definition of the sublime. Ah. So it's something that you know, just such all in this you know, purity I've never heard. The duet, he says, would bring tears to Jack's eyes. And Canning starts to hum the melody, but Jack joins in singing the words. 
singing in Italian, which is shocking for me, yeah. from Jack. And, and then they both join in. They sing it through a couple of times. And the others listen, as O'Brien writes, a mild, bemused, contemplative satisfaction. And it seemed to them natural that their captain should impersonate a Spanish lady. I'm thinking, wow, something something is sort of, you know, wow, what Jack is singing in Italian when he can't, you know, he can't even order dinner. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and everybody's like, oh, of course, Jack would take on this, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the persona of a, a Spanish lady. There's certainly something going on with this opera and this verse here. Right. You think, Ian? Yeah. And I mean, by the time we get a few more books into the canon, we realize that Marriage of Figaro is the Mozart opera work that O'Brien's going to come back to over and over again. Surely not a coincidence, it is a really great opera. And also, it's a story about men and women and philandering and infidelity, as we said before. <laughs> and it's really fascinating to pick up on this particular aria that O'Brien has chosen to have these characters singing right now. You know, I, I love that it comes up right after McDonald's had just had this big discussion about the sublime. Yeah. You must have a notion of the sublime to appreciate some things. And that, you know, I'm thinking, okay, so now this is the example, right? It's an example of the sublime here. This opera, can you tell us a little bit about what they're singing, Ian, and what's going on here? Sure. So th this phrase, sotto i pini, means underneath the pines. And it's in the context of a full verse that says, A gentle zephyr breeze will sigh this evening beneath the pine grove. He will understand the rest. Certainly he will understand the rest. Little tune on the breeze. And this is a duet sung between uh, Susanna and the Countess. And basically they're conspiring to write a letter. And in this letter they'll talk about gentle zephyrs and breezes and beneath the pine grove with the intention of luring the Count into a compromising situation. And when they say, he will understand what they mean is we don't have to fill in the rest for him. Once we talk about gentle zephyrs and under the pines, he'll know what we're on about. So it's two women taking care of the situation by conspiring to bring this guy uh, into a tricky situation. It is beautiful and also you know, f full of all of the themes of love and dishonesty and self-deception. <sighs> And also used in other works as well. Mike, one of the great occasions when this um, particular aria is used uh, is in the movie The Shawshank Redemption. This, though, in the context of freedom. I think the character in Shawshank Redemption is talking about freedom. Uh, the character Andy plays this as a gramophone record across the PA of the whole prison and, uh, and gets into trouble for it. Yeah, and, and freedom and hope. And the sublime. And I think this, you know, all of these notions get wrapped up so beautifully in that scene from Shawshank. Yeah. Train? Train? Andy, let me out. Andy? Andy? I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free. So we'll get that clip out to you on our socials and we'll put it on our YouTube playlist and we hope you can all enjoy it as well. Now, as well as the idea of the sublime, but there's also something to cling to in the world of Stephen and Jack and Diana and Sophie here. That last phrase, um, il capira, he will certainly understand is sung over and over again with beautiful decoration. He will understand. He will understand. Women singing about how they can make a man understand the situation, how they can draw him into uh, a compromising situation. It's very, very beautiful. 
very apposite and not the, the last time that we're going to dig into the, the, the plot of Marriage of Figaro to make points about what's going on between the characters here in the Patrick O'Brien books. Yeah, it, it kills me because I, I think, Ian, if I'm remembering this right, the Count thinks that he should have his way yeah. with this young servant girl because she's about to marry one of his servants and he as the Count gets to do this. And his wife's not up for it. The servant girl is not up for it. And so they're going to take it from there to uh, swap identities when the Count comes to have his way. Exactly. So I, I, I do love that and how he will understand. And boy, will he understand yeah. when it's all said <laughs> and done here. Right. Well, they, they've now grown affectionate listening to this beautiful song sung by Canning and the Captain. And they've been really coming to admire Canning more and more, the way he talked about the polycrest, he talked about the meal. And finally, there's this kind of crowning achievement. The royal toast is proposed and Canning jumps up so quickly that he bangs his head on the roof. And of course, everybody is just so kind to him. You know, they don't want him to feel bad. And he's saying, oh my gosh, you know, I must look like such a green hand. And they're going, no, 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 happens all the time. Don't worry about it and everything. And everyone at the dinner joins in to singing and they're singing more and more. They're all so happy with each other, except for Parker, who O'Brien tells us is bored because he can't tell one tune from the other. But he tries to move his mouth as if he's singing and to look somewhat jolly here. But they're going through these various sea songs, including a song with the lyrics, three, three, the rivals, two, two, the lily white boys clothed all in greeno. But one is one and all alone and evermore shall be so. And after that song, Stephen says, you know, there's a certain symbolism here that escapes me. And Canning starts to answer him, but they're cut off when everybody starts singing Three Blind Mice. So here we go. <laughs> three rivals and three blind mice. This is what's going on and on. And, and yeah, this, this killed me a little bit. You know, I, I was digging deep into this Green Grow the Rushes, yeah. which has many different versions. It goes back through history. And there's been a lot of chat in the in the you know in the gun room about what this means and all this stuff. But I think actually, when you come back to it, it's right here on the surface. Yeah. <laughs> this is Stephen and Jack and Canning, the three rivals right. or the three blind mice, all in this thing here. And so I think for this interpretation, it's all there here. Yeah. The operative phrase is this three, three, the rivals, you know, these three rivals for Diana. And in some ways, each one of them being some version of the three blind mice. Yeah. It's the last thing that everyone hears, especially Jack, as Canning is singing as he's rowed home away from the boat here. And I welcome our listeners to come back and go to the Lily White Boys or to, you know, to go to any of, of, of the rest of this long song with lots of, you know, it's kind of like the, the 12 days of Christmas yeah. almost it, with lots of medieval kind of spiritual beliefs mixed in with Christianity anyways. But I, I think after they hear Canning kind of sound in on this thing with his big, deep uh, uh, voice, some of the guys there say, uh, Boanerges, and they're describing Canning singing at the end of one of these. And, you know, I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's the name that Jesus calls James and John, his apostles, yeah. the sons of thunder. What? What do they mean? But it comes from an Aramaic that can be translated sons of rage that also kind of represent a fiery and destructive zeal similar to a thunderstorm. Or as one of the lower definitions in, in one of the better dictionaries says, a lot of testosterone right. all in one place. And I thought, yeah, here we are. So these three rivals, we may see a lot more of these three rivals and three blind mice. You might say that's true. Yeah. So... Stephen passes on his thanks to Jack and says, this was a successful dinner party, one of the most successful I remember being afloat. And that's quite something coming from Stephen, who's not normally Mr. Sociable. And Jack decides that he's going to wait for some light before he's going to take the polycrest out. The fender men are ready with fenders on the end of long poles uh, for, so that as he leaves, as he unmoors, 
Um, he can fend off any man of war or convoy member that he might drift onto. He gives orders for the ship to be ready at 3 a.m. and they're going to be taking the uh, orders of the master, who is a channel pilot, as they navigate their way out of the anchorage here. By 2 a.m., Jack is up on deck. He sees the possibility of a blow, of a, a, a storm, a gale of wind in the distance. His orders require him to be off the headland at 3 a.m. to fire a blue light and to receive a passenger from a boat that will answer his hail with the word Bourbon and that that's, this passenger needs to be taken to Dover as fast as possible. And as they go off on this mission, they do indeed sight initially a sail, a boat, but this is a small boat headed very quickly in the wrong direction. She's a deal shell, which is to say she's a very, very lightweight, very fast, very narrow, fragile little boat, what's called a death or money boat. She's a smuggler, and since she's tra- traveling from England to France, she's carrying gold. Now, the master wonders if Jack plans to snap her up. And this is entirely in line with Jack's reputation. If he does so, he's going to have to move right away. Jack's looking at this. He's looking at the prospect of five or six hundred pounds of money. He could press seven prime hands, the best seaman on the coast, but that would put him an hour out of the way of his rendezvous. The chase could well be even longer than that again, and the polycrest would then have to beat back to sail upwind back to where he needs to be, her worst point of sailing. So, with great forbearance, Jack decides against pursuing this deal shell. And meanwhile, he paces backwards and forwards 20 times until the prize is definitely out of the reach and he can no longer second guess himself. So, Mike, they are off the headland. As per orders, the blue light goes up. It's 3 a.m. The dirty weather is still on the way in. There's no sign of this boat coming off. And at 4 a.m., Jack orders the ship to turn away to sink the land because that night's version of the mission is done. They don't get back the next night, and they're on the other side of the channel fighting seas so bad that Jack thought that he would have to abandon the mission and return to Hart with his tail between his legs. But at the final dawn, at the third possible rendezvous, the storm abates. They get across very, very angry water. They're pumping all the way, and it's 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 really hard going. Interesting here that Jack is paying really, really close attention to obeying Hart's orders to the letter, something that he never bothered with back in Master and Commander. But Hart, I think, actually doesn't want that, but Jack is going to do it anyway because Jack is bent in all kinds of ways out of shape by this whole situation. So, Mike, it's uh, it's it's tough going for everybody, including the officers here. Yeah, the, the you know, ship's bouncing all over the place. Everyone in the gun room is working hard to keep their food on the table. And Stephen asks McDonald if he suffers from seasickness. McDonald says, no, I'm from the Western Isles where we're in boats as soon as we're breached. And Stephen recalls that there was a Lord of the Isles. And he says, I assume that's from your family, McDonald bows. Stephen says, this has always seemed the most romantic title to him, even greater than all these Irish titles. The Lord of the Isles, he says, it gives a feeling of indeterminate magnificence. And Stephen says he recalls hearing two of McDonald's men talking with each other earlier in the day. And Stephen had a bit of an epiphany. He could understand them. And McDonald's kind of astonished. He says, you have the Gaelic? And Stephen says, well, I thought I could no longer speak or understand it. But today, with no attempt on my part, I did. And McDonald says, well, you know, yeah, some of the press men are Irishmen. And, you know, these Irishmen and his Marines speak to each other all the time. And Parker happens to walk in just as they say that. And he says, well, if he heard it, they'd be on his defaulters list. Stephen says, well, why is that? Parker says, Irish is forbidden in the Navy because Mm. it's prejudicial to discipline and a secret language calculated to foment mutiny. And I'm thinking, wow, (laughs) you know, boy. So Stephen and McDonald are building a real nice understanding with each other and a connection. And Parker's just still an ass. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the ship takes these big rolls and McDonald somehow managed to catch the decanter and tell Stephen that he, if he can find an unbroken glass, McDonald would love to have a drink with him. <laughs> he says, you know, Stephen, from the way you spoke about my ancestor, you clearly have a delicate sense of the sublime. And the sublime is what proves Ossian's authenticity. Allow me to recite you a short description of the dawn. And I think here we are again, O'Brien underscoring this thing 
about the sublime, yeah. appreciation of the sublime. And when you hear you know, Stephen talk about Diana, it's always in that same kind of awe yeah. from this wonder and beauty and this thing. I love that. <sighs> well, f- from the sublime to the wet. <laughs> We're at the third possible um, instance of this rendezvous. The blue light goes up again that same night, but this time there is a boat. A boat pulls off from shore. Two minutes later, another boat is following it, firing on the first boat. Jack orders the ship to close the range and screams orders to overcome the disorder that he's seeing on the foredeck with the crew handling the sails. They finally get a good, clear angle. They run off and try to intercept the second boat, but it's gotten off a lot of shots. The, the lead boat, the boat being chased, is the boat that answers with this password, Bourbon. And as they pull up, there's a body crumpled in the stern sheets. In bad French, Jack tries to ask if he's badly hurt, il est mauvaisement blessé, but he can't understand the Frenchman's answers, which is the great handicap of every ignorant Englishman trying to speak a few words of French. Jack calls for the doctor. Stephen recognizes this agent, this young Bourbon royalist agent, His aorta has been nicked by a bullet and he bleeds out without a word. So what might have been a whole other episode and a whole other branch in the story here turns out to have been a bit of a dead end. And Jack has to go and report this dead end to Admiral Hart. Hart says, well, that's a matter for the Admiralty, but tell me about this death or money boat, this potential little prize offering that Jack had failed to snap up. And Jack realizes that this is why Hart is in such a bad mood on this day. He has to explain that he could not have beaten back to his station on time. Hart says, well, we all know the tag about a workman saying something about his tools. A a, a bad workman always blames his tools. And this fellow, he says, was not even at the rendezvous. These foreigners never are. So with perfect hindsight, Hart can pick holes in Jack's decision making here. Even with a crew of old women, you would not have been more than half an hour late. And here's the real rub. Another boat in the fleet, the Amethyst, had picked up this very same deal smuggling boat and taken 1,100 guineas off of her. So that's, what, 1,200 pounds. Hart says, this made me really mad. This is the source of Jack, of, of, of Hart's disappointment, how Jack had made a cock of the whole thing. And we remember, of course, that this is one of the reasons why Hart was pretending to be, to be happy to have Jack in his command here because he thought Jack would snap up some prizes and that he, Hart, might get the Admiral's share this time. So Jack realizes, though, that the Amethyst would have been sailing under Admiralty orders. So even though the Amethyst had taken this little deal smuggler, Hart doesn't get a cut. So Hart is out by £150. Even so, there's no use crying over spilt milk, says Hart. Um, After I take the convoy down, you're going to wait here for the ships written down on a list that I'm going to give you. You're going to escort these merchantmen to the Rock of Lisbon. And Hart says, I'm certain that by the time you've done that mission and come back here, um, you'll have made good on this little mess, since there will be no cast iron rigid rendezvous in your orders. And this sounds like maybe Jack's going to get the chance to be Jack Aubrey once again. Even so, Mike, there's... uh, that there's punishment and more to be taken care of aboard the Polycrest. Yeah. So, you know, we move ahead, the convoy, you know, with Hart and everybody pulling out and the Polycrest is gathered to witness punishment. And, and Jack is still trying to balance this need for establishing this unquestioning discipline early in the commission with all this self-defeating harshness of Parker yeah. and the bosun and other words. And after this is all done, Stephen asks Parker for a boat so he can go walk on the Goodman Sands for an hour. And Parker, who's always in a good mood after flogging, gives him the blue cutter. And and Stephen has almost a mystic time on shore looking at, uh, you know, O'Brien has this fabulous description of of what's going on there. You 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 mentioned, Ian, you love some of this writing. Oh, it's great. Um, And... This is a very eerie thing. We, we talked about this last time we read through Post Captain. Dover and Deal and the Downs are places of a sort of mystic weirdness and a feeling of isolation for the principal characters. And here's Stephen almost seeking out the isolation, but then really noticing it. It's described as being not unlike a, a, a laudanum state. And here Orion says, as Stephen's wandering around on the sands at low tide, Fresh sandpits appeared stretching far, far away to the north, 
under the cold, even light. Islands joined one another, gleaming water disappeared, and only on the far rim of his world was there the least noise, the lapse of small waves, the remote scream of gulls. It grew smaller, insensibly diminishing, grain by grain. Everywhere there was a secret drawing in, apparently only in the widening channels between the sandbanks, where the water was now running, frankly, from the sea. So, in this otherworldly um, isolation that Stephen is relishing, there's also danger, right? Because the tide is turning and has turned. So, the boat's crew is content with their fishing, but Stephen now, we slowly realize, is in a, is in a bad situation, right? Yeah, he is. He realizes that he's he's lost his shoes here. <laughs> well, one of the crew members who had been making fun of Stephen, you know, walking around, waving his arms, talking to himself, has gotten into a fight with some of the old Sophies in this argument about the doctor. And the, and the other Sophies are kind of all joining in, singing, singing Stephen's praises, talking about his learning and his languages and his ability to, as they say, whip a man's skull off, rouse out his brains, set him to rights, stow him back in, clap on a silver plate, sew up his scalp, as neat as the sailmaker of a king's yacht. And after all these tales of Stephen's amazing accomplishment, this new crew member, Simmons, is, as O'Brien says, vexed by their devotion. That deeply irritating quality says, well, He's lost his boots now for all his learning. So he's also seen that Stevens realized that where his boots had been, pfft, it's lots of water. And Stevens taking off his wig and his clothing place is like beside himself. Remembering that Babington had said he's going to have the hide off them if they let the doctor go wandering on the sands. So they're screaming at Stephen to stop. <laughs> Stephen, however, wants to recover these valuable lead soled shoes he just walks out in the water, holds his nose, and plunges. The boat comes <laughs> over and is trying to rescue him, and instead they're making a real mess of it. A boat hook catches his ankle. An oar strikes the nape of his neck, pushing his face into the sand. One foot happens to come up because they've turned him by uh, you know, hitting him like this, and they grab him and pull him on board. But Stephen's holding his boots and they give him this unbelievable lecture about, you know, not answering their hail, what he thought he was doing swimming this season, where he left his intellectuals, what would the <laughs> captain and pullings and back, just on and on and on. But when they finish, they dry him with their handkerchiefs, they dress him by force, they roll very quickly back and, you know, say, you've got to get straight into your room between blankets, no sheets, a pint of grog and a good sweat. And Lakey and Place actually, you know, basically trundle Stephen aboard the ship and go right to the cabin and give his servant orders for his care. <laughs> it's funny. We've got this odd confluence of the, the tender, like looking after for each other that we have between seamen, but also the, the odd sort of disconnected relationship between Stephen and the rest of the ship's crew. He's still really a lubber and they still really don't understand him. Pullings then stops by to see if Stephen's okay. I'm fine, says Stephen. My boots also are fine, which is what he cared about. What was all the ceremony after I came aboard? And Pullings says, well, the captain came back just after you. And this is another little cold moment of realization here. Stephen hadn't been aware that the captain had been out of the ship. And I don't think we have to imagine very hard to figure out where Jack Aubrey had been. When we do meet Jack, though, he's in high spirits. He's telling Stephen that he had arranged for Killick not to disturb the Doctor, and Jack had been hoping to play some music on this very unpleasant night in front of a drawing fire and drink some of the excellent Madeira that Canning had sent over. And Mike, here's another strike to the heart of our love for these two characters. Stephen identifies the smell that's hanging around Jack. It's the French scent that he, Stephen, had bought from smugglers for Diana. And again, Stephen is not one to confront Jack with this. He's trying to rescue the situation or preserve the decorum of, the, of, of him being aboard ship. He says, I'm not quite well. I'm going to turn in early. And Jack, of course, not realizing where this momentary withdrawal actually originates from, tries to get onto helping Stephen out. He says, I'm very concerned about you. I heard you went swimming. I hope you haven't caught a chill. 
well, he has caught a chill, but it's not a physiological chill. It's an emotional chill. And in his journal, Stephen writes, kind of chiding himself, that it's unspeakably childish to be upset by what he smelled. But he is upset. He's going to exceed his daily allowance and take 500 drops of laudanum tonight, which is a pretty flipping big dose of laudanum. Mm -hmm. After drinking off his laudanum, he writes, Smell is of all the senses by far the most evocative, perhaps because we have no vocabulary for it. Nothing but a few poverty-stricken approximations to describe the whole vast complexity of odour, and therefore the scent, unnamed and unnameable, remains pure of association. It cannot be called upon again and again and blunted by the use of a word, and so it strikes afresh every time, bringing with it all the circumstances of its first perception. And I'm reading this going, wow. Mm -hmm. it's, it's great and true, isn't it, about how evocative smell is and how intangible and unnameable it is, but how unambiguous the association is for Stephen. And he's, he's right there, you know, with, with, well, as, as he says here, no, no blunting, no wearing down. And in another way, in another context, we're back to the sublime again, right? We are. We are. It's absolutely that. And you know, so Stephen's thinking that the scent, when he smelled it, brought back Diana right there at the St. Vincent Ball, vividly alive, with none of the vulgarity or loss of looks he sees today. And Stephen applauds that loss and hopes it will continue. O'Brien writes, she will always have that quality of being more intensely alive, that spirit, dash, and courage, that almost ludicrous, infinitely touching, unstudied, unconscious grace. I mean, you want a definition of the sublime. There it is. Yeah. Boom. But he thinks if her face is her fortune, her wealth is diminishing. Perhaps before her, air quotes, fatal 30th year, it may reach a level at which I am no longer an object of contempt. That, at all events, is my only hope and hope I must. And I'm thinking, yeah. oh my gosh, this is so, you know, we're so into Stephen here. I'm thinking about Andy going, yeah, yeah I'm playing that music for, for the prisoners. This yeah. whole, all of this is coming together here. But Stephen goes on and he, he thinks, you know, but her vulgarity is new. It's, it's not just like a reflection of the others around her like she had at the St. Vincent Ball. He wonders if it's from a hatred of Sophie or something more complex. If it grows, will it destroy her grace, he wonders? That would destroy me, he thinks. And then he reflects that in a relationship of this kind, each makes the other to some extent. No man could give her more opportunity for exercising all her worse side than I. And I'm thinking, boy, you know, now we're really digging deep here yeah. about how we, what we bring out in, in these deep relationships that we have. Oh. And, and for Stephen to be ra rationalizing in her favor here just shows us and reminds us that he is absolutely hooked. He is in, in love in the very, very deepest way with Diana, that he doesn't have any options. He might have been thinking about options earlier on in the book about maybe breaking off. But this is him saying, I am stuck with this. And my best hope here is to wait until she she has her looks fading a little so that maybe I, with my less than less than beautiful looks, might have a chance. And he's blaming himself a little for bringing out the worst in her. And man, has he got it bad. This moment, triggered by him recognizing the scent, is just, it's, it's great writing, but it's a terrible, terrible moment, I think, in the story of Stephen Maturin. Oh, boy. So he actually thinks, as he goes on in his diary here, that there's more to mutual destruction than just that. Um, he then reflects on another misunderstanding between a couple that he's heard about. Recently, the purser on the polycrest had come to him asking for some kind of drug treatment that would reduce or blunt his sexual desire. This man is married. He thinks that his wife is everything that a man could wish for, but is very religious, very virtuous, and doesn't like sex. He is full-blooded and sometimes burns for sex. He went to see so that he would not do her a mischief. And he says, as the doctor knows, 
He's not suited for naval life. He's always the one who bails from the dinner table seasick. And he's talked with her about it. And sometimes she'll turn to him again for a day or two. But his heart is agonized by, by the fact that he knows it's all duty. And this is a terrible quote from the, the person here. He says, a man cannot still be asking. And what you ask for is not given free. It is never the same, no more like than chalk and cheese. A man cannot make a whore of his own wife. And he goes on to say that the, his wife is coming to visit him at Deal, and if the doctor will provide some kind of drug that can influence sexual desire, he, he knows that there are some drugs that increase sexual desire, so maybe there are some that will take it away. He would rather, he says, be cut than continue like this and make a whore out of his wife. And what what does this make Stephen think of? Like he's painting himself into a role of kind of setting up a bad character and a bad situation for Diana, which is something he's never going to be able to reason his way out of. He's really really stuck in this. I think. Yeah, this this whole idea about how we shape each other and you know influence each other and and these oh which, which, God, which is I great in a relationship when there's mutual love, right? But it's right. it's terrible right. and destructive when not. Yeah. Well, some days later, Stephen writes in his diary that that Aubrey, J.A., he always writes, is abusing his position. He didn't sail when the ships that he was waiting for finally arrive and all the arrangements had been made. He, Jack, wanted to be ashore instead. And he takes all these crazy risks going ashore. And Stephen knows that if he protests, it just appears to, you know, Jack, that this would be like Stephen, bad faith. You know, I don't want you to be with Diana. And he says that the devil suggested to him, Stephen, that he should have laid Jack by the heels and that Stephen certainly could. He said the devil even had many good reasons, altruistic, including honor and duty. I'm surprised the devil didn't even mention patriotism. Right. But he knows, you know, Jack is somewhat aware of Stephen's feelings. He says that when Jack brought an invitation to dinner with Diana at Diana's, he made a big deal of the coincidence of happening to run into her again, which made him feel a surge of affection for Jack, despite his animal jealousy. And Jack, he says, is the worst of liars. He knows. But Stephen, however, nonetheless found the dinner agreeable. And he says that when he has a warning... He can support more than he supposed. So I think Stephen's kind of saying, you know, gosh, I, I wouldn't think that I could take it sitting there with Jack and Diana and everything, but but I could. And then he finishes with one last journal entry here. This is now Stephen talking about this last encounter that he'd had with Jack and Diana together. We spoke companionably of former times, ate very well and played. This cousin is one of the most accomplished flautists I've, uh, I've heard. I know a little of D.V., Diana Villiers, but it appears to me that her sense of hospitality, she is wonderfully generous, overcame all her more turbid, that is to say, confused feelings. I also think she has a kind of affection for the both of us, although in that case, how she can ask so much of J.A. passes my understanding. She showed at her best. It was a delightful evening, but how I long for tomorrow and a fair wind. If it comes round into the south, if he is wind-bound for a week or ten days, he is lost. He must be taken. And Mike, I, I know Stephen is writing. Oh, sorry, end of chapter eight. <laughs> yeah, <you> yeah. <laughs> I, I know Stephen is writing here, taken in the sense of taken by the, the tip staffs for debt. But I think there's also another kind of taken, like he's doomed if right. he if he sticks around here. Wow. Right. What what a chapter, Mike. And oh, I, I can hardly bear it how we're getting deeper and deeper into this really, really tangled relationship involving Stephen and Jack and Diana. And 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 Sophie as well. You know, we opened with all of Sophie's anguish about her situation. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny, in my immediate reaction at the end of this chapter was reminded of that scene where Jack had absolutely nothing to serve his guests in the cabin. And the next minute, Killick comes aboard and there's this overflowing abundance, thanks to Sophie. And this chapter reminds me of that abundance. I mean, I love Master and Commander, but chapters like this in Post-Captain, you know, make me think sometimes that Master and Commander was was an 
appetizer compared to this, if, yeah. I, if I could say sublime abundance here. Right. Oh, agonizing. That's what it is. <laughs> Now, like we said, Stephen and Sophie have got this really touching friendship, this close brother and sister connection, and they're helping each other a little bit, I think, and they're learning about the relationships between the others, including Jack and Diana. But I think it's also agony for them that this is the one place where they can exchange kind of honest, confidential talk. If we could have had the same kind of honest and confidential talk between some of the other characters, things might not be so bad, but maybe we can come back to that. It's a little bit disappointing that Jack is not responding to Sophie and not working through things with Stephen. To think about the secondary characters for a second, Stephen and MacDonald, for all MacDonald started out as a comedy character who cared about his, his Ossian manuscripts, him and his view of the sense of sublime and his connection to Stephen and his connection to Scottish-Irish Gaelic culture has been really fascinating. It's brought the two of them together. They managed to get away from having an outright argument at dinner to some kind of understanding of each other. And this omnibus quote at dinner was, oh, really, really compelling. So I, I don't know. We have hopes, I think, for MacDonald that he can stick around and maybe maybe help Stephen to reach something that's a bit more sublime than his current relationship with Diana. But right, I, I was just a little bit miffed, although at the end... Um, that there was that final dinner between Jack and Diana and Stephen and the cousin. But all of that took place off camera. I think I might have quite liked to have been there for that one. But I, I guess at this stage in the book, O'Brien is quite aware that he's given us lots of shore based social action, you know, Jane Austen style. And perhaps some readers, still with Hornblower in mind, are keen to, uh, to get back to see and see what's going to happen next. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I'm always keen to get back to C as well, but I've got to admit that the, the way O'Brien does this kind of Venn diagram, if you will, of the intersections of the likeness and differences of people right. like Jack and Canning and Stephen and McDonald and Sophie and Diana, people who sometimes seem to be not at all alike, but surprisingly share some common characteristics and interests, sense, sensibility, and, and get bound up by fascinating things like language and music and appreciation of the sublime, or can become bitterly opposed and incredible rivals to each other and do great uh, harm. I mean, clearly, you know, we had this with Jack and Dylan yeah. and Stephen in Master and Commander, but now, boy, we're, I mean, O'Brien is, is made this his own. I, I love that. I love that. It is great. It is to me, in, in this chapter, though, a little continuation of what we used to see as those bear suit differences between Jack and Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> Jack is not leading. Stephen perhaps is a little more leading. Jack doesn't get the prize. He doesn't succeed in his mission. He delays the convoy to see Diana. He risks getting arrested every time he's ashore. He's unsuccessful and act doing stupid things. Stephen seems to see things a lot more clearly all the way around for Jack in terms of Diana. And although he's seen as doing something stupid by the crew, like going in after them, he comes out of the water with his boots in hand, <laughs> despite the crew's interference. So it's still this little bit of theme like, okay, Jack, I don't know. Stephen, still doing it here. Yeah. I don't know. And, and I couldn't help but wonder a little bit, Jack and the Polycrest, now I'm looking back with this Bourbon agent going, you know, was that why this... Jack had to get down. Jack's given the polycrest. It had to be really quick. Was it this Bourbon contact for Stephen? Was it, there was this whole mission for Stephen? Is, Jack, is Stephen the reason Jack got this ship? Yeah. I, I don't know. Perhaps that's far-fetched, but I was thinking, fascinating, fascinating. Yeah, and uh, you can do all sorts of things by looking backwards and wondering why. You know, what, how, all, all the way back to the beginning of Master and Commander, we can wonder how and why. Was this kind of predestined, preordained somewhere? Nobody knows. It's it's all, right. as we keep saying, it's all deliciously ambiguous. Right. But at this point, whether Stephen is having a role in the fate of Jack Aubrey is a really fascinating and really kind of character-building thing here. Anyhow, all is not well with Jack and Stephen. All is not well with Diana and Sophie. All is not well in the Channel Fleet either. We've got Hart coming down on Jack for following orders to the letter, like that's ever been a problem in the past. There's the possibility of some jeopardy for Jack, not only from being arrested for debt, but from coming under Hart's gaze here if he doesn't deliver any prize money. However, 
that all depends on whether Jack can keep himself away from the attention of the debt collectors ashore because there's no possibility of prize money or anything else if he ends up stepping ashore in search of Diana and getting arrested for debt. So Mike, every chapter here is wrapped up with more and more tension for the principal characters, for their relationships, for the ships and the men involved as well. This book, I think, is reaching a climax. <sighs> yeah, I would think so. Although I, I noticed, I think there's like 14 chapters instead of O'Brien's usual 10. So we exactly. got a lot more to come. So I have to ask you, and what do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With a little trepidation, but with all my heart. <laughs> begs Cecilia to see this guy in the wardroom. Sorry, in the wardroom. (laughs) 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 And begs Cecilia to see him in the drawing room.